Thank you, everyone. I'm not sure what Dr. Kinsel said, but I'm just going to jump into this. And I want everyone to know that, that the slides will be made available. So please do not feel the need to take notes or things like that. But if you want to, you certainly can. So this webinar today is going to be about military corrosives. And I'm sure some of you are wondering, what is, what is Castro talking about this time? But I'm going to talk about military corrosives and how they disrupt military readiness. So without further ado, let me jump right into this. So just a bit about my Self. I know that uh, Dr. Kinsel may have said some things. I'm a full professor, uh, tenured professor in the School of Social Work, which I'm quite proud of at the University of Southern California. And you'll see that on the bottom of the slides. Um, I served 33 years in the military, uh, began as a private, retired as a colonel. Uh, I was born in Kansas City. Um, but the most important thing is really the next slide. Things that you're not going to be able to sort of get, but I want you to know about me and in this presentation specifically. First, I'm extremely patriotic. I love America and I love the Army. I actually love all the services, but, you know, my first love is the Army, and so I don't want to hide that. You'll see that kind of crop, crop out. But I love all veterans. I love the military. And I think the military is a very important organization in, in America. I believe character matters, and you're going to see a lot of that coming across in things that I say as well. And I acknowledge that I'm a person of privilege. I have a lot of privilege. Some of it is unearned. Some of it is earned. Uh, and I think it's important to distinguish when we talk about privilege, what privileges have been earned and what haven't. I'm a strong believer in individual rights, but also in individual responsibility as well. And, and I think that will come across. So I think for every right we have, we have a responsibility associated with it. I also believe that opinions and beliefs are only valid if they can be intellectually defended. Okay, and that'll come up more. Everyone makes mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes in this talk. I will say things that you may disagree with, and that's fine. Let's just let's just agree to disagree, or we can continue the conversation. If you have any questions, please just put them in the chat. I'm very, very team oriented. And so I think more is accomplished when we work together versus when we work as individuals or in small cliques or in small groups. So that'll come out as well. I identify myself based on what I do and how I treat other people. So my identity, yes, I'm a veteran. Yes, I'm I served in the military. Yes, I'm a professor. Yes, I'm a husband. Yes, I'm a dad. But I really define who I am based on what I do and how I treat other people. So the purpose of my talk, as many of you know, the military, what's the purpose of the talk? I'm going to talk about military corrosives from the standpoint of military readiness. I will argue in this presentation that corrosives weaken the military and it threatens its ability to fight and win our nation's wars. And you can see there, that's how I view the mission of the military. It's to fight and win our nation's wars. Corrosives can damage an organization at all levels, at all levels, um, tactical, operational, strategic. While there are many corrosives that require attention in the military, I'm only going to focus on five. Five that I've done a lot of research on, I've collaborated with other people doing research on, I'm only going to focus on five. There's my outline, I'm not going to go through it, but if you're wondering what are those five approaches I'm going to talk about, you can see them right here. I'm going to talk about military suicides, military sexual assault, racism in the military, radicalization of service members and veterans, and LGBT discrimination in the military. Each of these are their own series of talks. So I'm going to just go over those very, very quickly and kind of show you where I think the key issues are and offer some possible ways to address them, but not a definitive way to address them. And then I'll end with a, a take home message. So I'm going to go through these slides in the beginning, kind of slowly, but then I'll pick up the pace. Uh, and but again, these slides will be available to everyone. Whoops. I just want to just say that. Although I'm going to talk about these, these corrosives, these military corrosives, as they pertain 
to the US military, we must acknowledge or should acknowledge, and I base this on my extensive experience, these issues many, many nations grapple with. And I have given a series of talks around the world before the pandemic, webinars during the pandemic, and I've been even traveling now post-pandemic, although I know we're still kind of in the pandemic, talking about these challenges, these, these obstacles, these corrosives that the military grapples with. And there's NATO work groups on each one of these topics as well. And one of them, which I, I, I co-lead with a colleague from the United Kingdom. So, you know, I'm gonna talk about some negative things and, and, and I don't want to start talking about negative things in the military. Uh, and in the veteran space without first acknowledging the positive aspects of military service. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I do want to say go right to the very bottom two, and that is America is extremely supportive of the military and veterans. I can't emphasize that enough. I guess I said I've traveled the world. There is no country, none, zero, no countries that support the military and veterans to the extent that the United States does. All right, I'm just gonna leave it right there. We can disagree about that and discuss why I think that, but I think it's so true. The second, the last bullet, the military is a great organization to work for. I'm gonna talk about some things the military needs to work on. I don't want anyone to think, oh, he thinks the military is a terrible, I love the military. And I think the military is a great, great organization to work for. I owe almost all of my accomplishments, one could argue all of my accomplishments, to the military and my time in the military and even post-military. So and we can talk about that's an, its own talk in and of itself. These last two bullets are, all of these bullets are their own talks, but I just want to kind of get that on, on page. I think there shouldn't be any debate about any of those, those these, these bullets. Okay. There are aspects of the military culture that transcends the U.S. culture. I'm not going to go into this in any detail again, but we all know the purpose of the military is to fight and win our nation's wars. That's it. That's, that's the main thing. Now, the military can do lots of other things, and those are, could be humanitarian, peacekeeping, peace support, disaster relief, lots of other things. But the military doesn't exist for those other things. It exists to fight and win our nation's wars. And in doing so, it involves exposure to traumas, extreme traumas on purpose. Okay, so you don't fight and win your nation's wars without exposing the service members who are doing the fighting to trauma. Okay, we all know about the hierarchical, the teamwork. Again, I still embrace that. Um, and the unique military identity, I think, that we all have as well, okay? But, so I've already mentioned these. I mentioned the five that I'm going to talk about today. There are others, like a question mark. I, in my own mind, I can add three, four, five, six, seven, eight others. I'm sure everyone on, on, on this webinar can also think about other ones that I'm not going to be talking about. That doesn't mean they're not important. It just means I'm not going to talk about them today. But if we want to talk about them in the Q&A, please bring them up. Okay, so what are some causes? You know, why do corrosives exist? And I just listed five. Why do these exist? So they're sustained by a combination of factors, all right? And so here are some of the factors that I think are common to all of these corrosives, and there could be others, as I mentioned. First is the failure to show dignity and respect. Every service, whether you're Marine, Air Force, Navy, Army, they all have as a value of treating others with dignity and respect. And you get corrosives when, when you don't show dignity and respect, I will argue. It's a failure of leaders to make on-the-spot corrections, letting the little things go. It's this, it's this intolerance of other ideas, thoughts, or behaviors. So I, I know I can be like that, that things have to be done a certain way, and if they're not done a certain way, then I think, ah, I don't think it's quite right. But is that really true? Or is it just a different way? Sometimes a difference is just a difference. It's not right or wrong. It's just different. And sometimes when we have 
intolerance to these other ideas, say like different religious beliefs, different sexual orientations, this can lead to poor interactions or lead to not treating people with dignity and respect. It's going to appreciate and embrace diversity. I think diversity is really important. Diversity of opinion, diversity of thoughts, diversity of perspective. And I'm not talking necessarily gender or sexual orientation, but those are important too, because that's how you get diversity in thoughts, opinions, sometimes, not always, but most of the time. It's a point to reflect on our own biases and prejudice. I do this a lot, guys. You know, I why do I think this? Why am I feeling this way? It's disability, you know, if you don't reflect on why we think the way we do and behave the way we do, it can lead to not treating people with dignity and respect. And it's also a failure of organizations to set and enforce clear standards of acceptable behavior. And I'll tell you, the Army, probably of all the services, has the most regulations, the most policies, but sometimes it can still be vague, and sometimes it's deliberately vague, and we can talk about that as well. Okay. So what's the impact? So what? Who cares if we're not, you don't show people dignity and respect and we have all of these things and we don't specify how people should conduct themselves and what's appropriate, what's inappropriate? Who cares? Well, I think it lowers morale and disrupts cohesion. It creates distrust among soldiers and leaders. If your leaders are doing things that are self-serving or only oriented to a certain group and excludes other groups, then we're going to distrust our leaders. And leadership is really important in the military, particularly in the infantry, in the, in the soldiers, in the army, the Marines. Leadership is important in all the services. And it lowers, and it can lower the prestige of the military service among civilians. And I think when these three things happen, what can it, it can lead to is the lowering of military readiness by reducing combat effectiveness, retention and recruitment. I think many of you probably know that the Army is in a massive recruitment shortfall. The other services just squeak by on their recruitment efforts. But then we have trouble retaining people. People leave for various reasons, of course, but one of them could be my leaders didn't really give me the opportunities. And it can also lower the public support for the military. So if you think about all this wonderful support the military has that veterans have, if we don't get our arms around this, this can start eroding the trust that the public has in the military to solve their own problems. And we've seen a little bit of that recently in how the military has lost, you know, the commanders have lost control uh, prosecuting and handling sexual assault cases because of the the way they didn't really, I would say, embrace the seriousness of many of the accusations. And we can talk about that as well. Now, I just wanted to some cautions about corrosives. Corrosives do not self-correct. So if you just like, oh, well, we won't do anything and time will we'll take care of it. That's not how corrosives work. Direct actions at all levels is required. Corrosives should not be dismissed as political correctness. I know I've heard a lot of people, oh, we're just trying to be politically correct. I don't think I've ever been accused in my entire life of being politically correct. Okay, now, I'm not sure why that is. I think I'm sensible, but, but no one terms of Jews, you're being politically correct. Addressing these corrosives is not about being politically correct. It's about treating people with dignity and respect. That's what it's about. Successfully, successfully addressing these will require courage because of pushback. Because people will say, don't like change or they think you're being politically correct and they'll try to say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. And I will argue, I'll show you some data that I think all these things are important. Fixing them will not be easy. Okay, if they were easy, we would have already fixed them by now. The fact that we haven't fixed them isn't because people aren't interested in fixing them. It's some of them are hard. But we have to avoid overreacting at the same time. So you've heard the old adage, the cure shouldn't be worse than the disease, all right? So we shouldn't overreact, but we need to act, okay? I believe the military's focus on character and values can be leveraged to create a culture that values treating others with dignity and respect. As I mentioned, every service already has that as a value. It's just not really enforced 
or implement it in a way where everybody feels valued or feels they're being treated with dignity and respect, okay? The military leaders development programs can also be used to develop leaders who foster a culture. Like how do you foster a culture where everyone is respected and valued? That's easier said than done. I acknowledge that it's really hard to change a culture. Military is a big organization. So I'm not in any way trying to say this is easy, let's just do it, but we've got to start sooner versus later. And I see folks are raising their hand. We're gonna get to questions and answers at the end. I promise I will leave time for that. I will stop talking to address your questions and answers. So, but thank you, please continue to type in uh, your questions in chat to say, I have a question. That's all you need to do if you don't wanna type the whole thing in there, okay? So what is a corrosive? Right? So I've been blabbering on for five, 10 minutes about corrosive. By the way, I'm looking at my clock here. Um, what is a corrosive? Well, this is a dictionary definition. Uh, I think I got it from my Webster dictionary. I didn't pull it from Wikipedia, but I'm sure it's very similar. So a corrosive is an adjective and it's having the quality of eroding or eating away, harmful or destructive deleterious. Okay, so it's a bad thing, right? It's this quality of eating can be slow. And I've got some good pictures here of corrosives, and danger, right? So corrosives are not a good thing, all right? Corrosives are not a good thing. They're a bad thing. And we need to get our arms around them. Okay, so. I'm going to jump into, I'm going to talk about a lot of really sensitive issues. I'm going to start with military suicide. So I know some of these issues are, are really sensitive and personal. If you are, feel free just to go on mute or log off and log back in. Don't feel you need to kind of stay with it. All right. But I just want to sort of warn everyone, we're going to talk about some sensitive issues, but they're important issues that we have these conversations about. So. We first have to acknowledge that suicide events are extremely rare, all right? Extremely rare. That's why they're measured per 100,000, all right? They're rare. And, and they're rare because of all of these factors plus others, all right? I've just listed some of the, the, the top factors, all right? The human instinct is to live, not to die, okay? So that, you must overcome lots of religious and cultural barriers in many cases. Humans are resilient, both physically and psychologically. Okay, so when you look at sort of the, the risk factors that lead to dying by suicide, what you understand is, well, you know, like failed relationship as an example, almost everyone alive has had a failed relationship, but we're all not dying by suicide, okay? So we're both resilient. Doesn't mean it didn't hurt. Doesn't mean we don't feel bad, but our first, Reaction isn't to die by suicide, okay? There are infinite number of reasons to live, right? Well, there'd be the next partner, right? The next, the next girlfriend, the next boyfriend, okay? There's a belief in a better afterlife, all right? So this is where religion can play an important role and spirituality can play an important role that makes the present bearable with this belief in an afterlife. And lots of other reasons that make suicides extremely rare events. But they do happen. And when they happen, they can be catastrophic. Okay. I'm going to show you some quick data. This is all CDC data. You can get this from the web. This is not anything. But I just want to sort of provide some demographics so we can kind of think about this. So one, male suicide is much higher than women who die by suicide. I think you can see this. This is pretty, pretty clear. There's an age factor. Okay. And you can see the highest age factor for many, many years had been the 45 to 64 year old group. Okay, so my age group. Um, and you can see see the other the other differences there. And of course, the important thing to take away here is like the military is really more in the middle group, right? The 15 to 24, although 15 is kind of a an, an age that we wish I wish they had you know, make this like 17 to 24 versus 15 to 24, because that's the military age. But, you know, it's the data we have from the CDC. Okay? But you can see that that there's an important age difference. There's an important um, gender difference. And I just think this is interesting. All right. So this is just, I think this is interesting. So for many, many years, you know, 
there have been more homicides, more murders in America than deaths by suicide. But you can see around 2010, these lines started crossing. Now they may cross again, but just keep in mind when we talk about all the murders that happen, murder capital of the world and things like that, there are now more deaths by suicide than there are deaths by murder in America. Okay. America is not the only country that struggles with suicides. They're one of the biggest because of the number. But I will say this, they're probably America is somewhat unique in terms of comparison to Western society and even to many countries in, in Asia in terms of homicides. But I just want to sort of put this in perspective for folks. Here's Army data. Uh, Army's been tracking probably suicides more rigorously than the other services. Other services track it too, so please don't misunderstand that. But you can see the Army has been on this increase for many, many years. Now, I just want to point out that this, this graph here starts in 2008, but I have data that goes back to the mid-1980s where it's a third of this number. So this number just didn't start rising in 2008. This number, suicides in the Army started rising in around 2001. So good six, seven, eight years before this. And I just want to highlight that in before that, the numbers were much, much lower. And in fact, historically, until the last 20 or 30 years, at some point you have to stop saying historically. But at one time in the military, suicide rates were half or less than what they were among civilians. And now they're on par and in some years even higher. So this is a huge problem. It's I'm not going to say it's getting worse, but it's worse, and we've got a lot of work to do on it. Okay, this is just a veteran. I think we all know about veteran sites. They're coming down. Um, all of these numbers can fluctuate. I think we know that um, the, the the deaths among veterans and suicide is is really problematic, and and I think many of us know that the the VA and the nation has been focused on suicide prevention for a very very long time. This is just a, a, another slide showing from 2001 to 2019, and you can see it coming down. And, and we hope, it, again, these are whole numbers. What you really want to see it is per 100,000, so you can make direct comparisons. But this puts the numbers in real perspective. We're talking 6,000, 5,000 to 6,000 veterans dying every year due to suicide. That's just, you think about that. You know, and you add these up over time, you're talking large cities of people dying by suicide, but they're all veterans. So the point here is there's an active duty problem with suicides, and there's a veteran issue with suicides. So, and there are lots of things that, that often doesn't get counted as suicides, but, and this is known for those of you who study suicide by proxy, and that's in the military, the equivalent would be deliberate and exposing oneself to enemy fire without trying to actually achieve an objective or committing crime. So the police kill you. There's a whole kind of spike in the literature on this in the mid to late 80s, early 90s. Um, or there's engaging in extreme risk taking behaviors, right? Drug use, alcoholism. There's a whole theories around people who cannot overcome. All, remember the slide I showed you, all the barriers that why we live and don't die by suicide. So we slowly kill ourselves through drug use or alcoholism, or other high risk behaviors. So there's when you look at suicide data, you can't just look at suicide data. You have to look at all of these other high risk taking behaviors as well, I, I would argue, in order to really try to understand what's going on. Now, here's some key, some key findings that, that I think are really important. And the first one I think I already said, and that is that suicides have been increasing over the past three to four decades now. Okay. So don't think we, we can sometimes talk about it as, oh, this is a new phenomenon. It's not a new phenomenon. It's at least 20 years, 20 years suicides have been going up. And People have argued when they just thrown up, well, is it an update? Is it an aberration? It's, it's gone up. I think I showed you the slide. Now, there are three time points that we do know from empirical data when service members and veterans are most likely to die by suicide. 
And that's when they first join the military, upon returning home from deployment, and when they leave the military and go back to the civilian life. And Dr. Kinsel and I and others have written about this. This happens around key transition points. That's so we know where we can begin looking for interventions. Okay. So these are just some more numbers. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these other than to highlight that effective treatments for suicide remain elusive. Effective prevention efforts remain elusive. Okay. It's hard. These are very rare events. So it's really hard sometimes to say, so if you do these things, you'll prevent suicide. We do have effective treatments that help prevent suicide, but we don't have a silver bullet. We don't have a silver bullet. This is just a dual pathway. People have argued, uh, you know, here's just two. You can look at this. This is, we've written papers on this. I should have put the reference in here so you could, you could see it. But the idea is that combat can indirectly lead to dying by suicide. A couple of different models people have postulated. These are two of them here. And we also need to acknowledge, and, and I owe a great debt to Greg Bryan, who's talked about thinking about differently about suicide. He's written a book uh, on this topic. But we all have dark moments, right? These are sort of the, the using a stoic philosophy. We have these dark moments where we pain, belief in others. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but I think the point is that we need to acknowledge that people have these dark moments. I mentioned some of them and help them, give them the skills to navigate through them and to help people navigate through these dark moments. And you can see they vary for lots of reasons when we look at why people die by suicide. It's failed relationships, beliefs that they have failed to uphold the values that they believe in. This is the moral aspect, the social aspect, you know, the fear of rejection, lost girlfriend, boyfriend, debt, getting caught committing a crime. We see people dying in jail all the time, you know, from criminals. So these are the dark moments that we, need to, we want to help people get through. So we need to acknowledge, first, that the current approach isn't working. And this is hard. This is hard. We have been the military have been grappling with this, I just mentioned, 20, 30, 40 years and not really making much success, but hoping next year will be better. And I would just argue that hoping like that doesn't really help. OK. Um, also, we have to acknowledge that not every soldier, not every service member who's considered dying by suicide has mental health us at all. Oh, they have a mental health us. Most do not have a mental health disorder, um, but it gives us comfort thinking, oh, well, if they have a mental health disorder, then that, that's why they die by suicide. But I just mentioned lots of other reasons that don't have to. Uh, and we have to accept that these dark moments appear for everyone. Okay. This is sort of the strategy the military uses to, you know, suicide prevention efforts. You can look at this, but. I would argue that this is this approach is the one that hasn't worked. All right. Now, does it mean that this isn't useful? No, it could be useful information. All right. But it's not useful in the sense of developing effective prevention and early intervention strategies. Okay. The, the one, all service members are the military approaches suicide prevention is that every service member is at equal risk for dying by suicide. And we know that's not true. But that's the approach we take. And when you take an approach where everyone's at equal risk, then you don't focus then necessarily on those who are at increased risk. And remember those time points I mentioned, what's unique about them. Okay. So here is just a side-by-side -side comparison. I have argued in other places, other people have argued something similar. We need to take a what I would call a stoic approach to suicide prevention versus what I would call the current impairment model that the military uses. And I'm just not, I'm not going to focus on the, the current model. I think most of you are familiar with it. If you're not, it's highlighted here. But I think you have to take a strength-based approach. You have to focus on building character. You have to build, you know, values, valuing life with honor. We need tailored skill development. 
So not a sort of one size fits all. We need to emphasize cohesion and mentoring. We do talk about it in the military. All the services do. All the services struggle to implement what that means. And we need to be outcome focused. So is this actually resulting in a decrease in someone harming themselves or dying by suicide? And if it's not, it's not working. And we need to be open to changing. Right? We need to be open to changing. I will tell you, I've spoken to senior leaders who are reluctant to change the way we do things because they say that will communicate to the civilian community and to people who support the military that we don't know what we're doing. But how can you not admit what you're doing doesn't work? I said, well, don't admit it doesn't work. Just change what you're doing. But they won't even do that. So this is what makes it difficult sometimes when people don't want to admit what they're doing isn't working, right? As you all know, social work and psychology and to solve any problem, that's the first thing you have to admit. You've got a problem. And until you do that, there's not going to be meaningful change. So I will just say that the next steps is we need to really validate our suicide prevention efforts. We need to double down on proven interventions. There are some that do work. We need to consider the social determinants. What is it that the social aspects that cause someone to want to die by suicide, as well as the individual factors? You've got to consider both, not just one over the other. We need to be patient. We're not going to solve this overnight, but we can't be complacent. We've got to be doing things from a conceptual framework that we think is going to be meaningful. Okay. And I've taken I, most of my time talking about that, but I think it's was a really important topic. I'm going to now go through military sexual assaults, and then we're going to just go through the evidence fairly quickly. So this has been, a again, a 40, 50, 60-year problem, multiple decade problem. We do know that, that, that there are approaches um, that try to address sexual assault, but prevention efforts really are lacking. Okay, And the military, I would argue, is at a loss for new ideas. Probably it's a loss for new ideas generally. Okay, Focus still remains on detection and prosecution. Okay, You want to detect the perpetrator, which is extremely difficult to do. And we want to increase prosecution. I just mentioned how the military... They're taking prosecution now out of the hands of the military and put it into an independent body. The idea being that the military isn't prosecuting rigorously enough, uh, and therefore, if we take it away, we'll get more prosecutions. I remain skeptical of that only because I've seen the, the data from civilian courts and their conviction rates aren't any higher. So there's something more culturally systematic going on that I think that we're not paying attention to. This is just some data that shows um, the incidence of sexual assaults from males and females compared to civilian and military. And, and, I, and this slide isn't to say, see, we're not as bad as anybody else. I think that's a flawed way of thinking about it. My point here is to make is sexual assaults is a cultural problem and it's a global problem, okay? I don't want anyone thinking, oh, only the military has problems with sexual assault. It's totally not true. There's problems in universities, problems around the world on this topic. Okay, so please don't leave thinking only the military has this problem. It's a global problem. Doesn't mean the military doesn't need to solve it. They do. It's an important problem they need to solve. It's and it's illegal. It's criminal actions, right? It's criminal actions that are being committed both against women and men, but primarily women, all right? So a lot of people, well, don't forget about men. They're sexually assaulted too. I'm not, but let's be very clear. It's women who are more at risk for being sexually assaulted in the military than are men, okay? So I'm gonna, this is just some data that we've collected with uh, Dr. Sarah Kensel and I, just showing that sexual harassment is also very common in the military, um, and, and so is sexual assault. It looks like we may be making uh, some headway in there. Um, but the key is we've not solved this problem. We've got a lot of work to do. Okay. 
this is just some data to, that I always like to remind people. Remember I talked about transition into the military around suicide? Same thing with sexual assaults. 85% of sexual assaults among women service members occur within the first two years of military service. So what does that mean? I mean, when they're joining, they don't know who to trust. They're trying to make friends. And people violate that trust because it's normally a senior NCO, right? I'm going to, again, just the last bullet, there's NATO research groups on this because it's not just a U.S. problem. It's a national problem. It's a global problem, all right? So I just want folks, racism in the monetary, racism is not a new issue, okay? It's not a new issue. We've always had these undercurrents of racism in the military. It's not a new issue. And importantly, it, it affects readiness because it affects how we promote people, okay? It promotes how we promote people. And, and we need, you know, many services have, have done things like removing, you know, the Air Force and the Army now as well, to remove photographs from promotion records and things like that. But it's more it's more ubiquitous than that. It's this it's the naming of army installations after Confederate generals. It's not even Confederate troops. It's they're all generals. The ubiquitous of Confederate symbols that I know mean different things to different people. It's the disparity in punishment. There's some great research coming out that African American service members across all the services are punished disproportionately more severely than white service members across all services. They're underrepresented promotions, I mentioned that. And there still is this failure to embrace particularly African-Americans as equals in the military. And lots of folks are starting to work on this. It's a very sensitive issue. People think again, oh, you're just trying to be political. These are facts. You can look at the promotion rates. You can look at discipline and how discipline is administered. These are facts. We need to treat people fairly, equitably. Okay. Radicalization, it's a new, it's, not a, it's a fairly new focus, but there's always been some element of radicalization. Now, is the military radicalized? I No, it's not. It's not. Uh, they did a big study in the Army, particularly, or maybe it was across all DOD, excuse me, across all DOD. They found about 200 incidents of radicalized, radicalized behavior. And people say, well, see, that's not very much. Just 200 across 2 million people, that's not bad. You have to keep in mind, though, some of these incidents can be so severe they can be catastrophic. Okay, so 200 is a lot. All right, we can minimize it. We can view it from one angle. Well, it's not very many given how many people we have. But it depends on the 200 actions, right? So we need to, and why are there even 200? Because if there's 200 people acting, how many people think it's okay to do? How many people support them doing it? Okay, you can see that the circles get bigger when you start thinking about it just a little bit differently. Now, this is some early work that we have done looking at mass shootings, and you can look at the number of veterans, you know, the number of active duty, and you just kind of see where they, where they align but then you can see, like, what were the motivations, okay? Only 15% were mental health. Most of them were terroristic, trying to change something. Some were for revenge, power, profit, very little for profit, okay? Then, you know, people who used to join the military aren't joining the military to make bazillions of dollars, right? Because they know they're not going to make. So it's usually for ideological reasons or for power reasons. And, and that's really what we're trying to point out here. These are just some historical markers of sort of insensitivity or, or racial sort of underpinnings or anti-government underpinnings uh, that we've seen in the military. And it's in, as far back as we've looked, which is the Civil War, and we're all familiar with the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. But after every war, there's these movements of white supremacy, following almost every conflict, which is interesting in and of itself. People are looking at this in detail now, but I just want to highlight this is nothing new. This is nothing new. The work that we're doing is looking at what are those predisposed? Do people come into the military predisposed to behave this way? Or is there something about the military service? Or is there something about how veterans transition back that makes them more susceptible? 
Okay. I, I think it's, I, I want to argue, you know, I've got biases. My bias is ah, the military doesn't teach people to be radicalized. Okay. I know there's some who think that. I just told you, I love the military. I think the military is a great organization. I think it, that when veterans don't have good transitions out of the military, it makes them more susceptible to recruiting and, and other things like that. There are some risk factors, potential threats that could exacerbate this. The lost war in Afghanistan, the implementation of DOD extremist regulations. And for those of you who haven't seen them, I'm happy to share those. And then you, you get things that are potential and actual. You know, like there's folks who have postulated that the non-compliance with COVID-19 vaccinations, which I think is a blip. I don't think it's a it's a real issue. But how do we respond to violations of extremist regulations? What should be our response? Do you just get kicked out? So things that we can do to try to understand why service members or veterans feel a particular way and, and provide an effective intervention there. LGBT discrimination in the military, we all know it exists. You know, we used to have, you know, don't ask, don't tell policy, which is an explicit discrimination against LGBT uh, individuals. And some people still say it's still lingering. These are just headlines that I've, anyone can Google and, cl and clip these headlines. There's lots of headlines. And this, again, I just want to emphasize, these are issues that transcend the U.S. military. There are NATO working groups on all of these topics to get our arms around them. So what does it take for people to feel wanted and accepted? And this is a topic that we've looked at in, in some detail. Uh, Jeremy Goldbach, a colleague of mine, we developed a theory around this. I'm not going to go through all of this theory. You can have it or you, I can send you the paper. Here's the reference. But the aspect of it is this bullying aspect, right? And the military, almost by its nature, when I went to basic training at Fort Benning, one would argue that a lot of what happens there is bullying. Uh, I'm sure the Army, my Drill sergeants would say, no, that was training. We were developing you to de become a soldier, not converting a civilian into a soldier, right? But bullying is different in that it's an abuse of authority. And it, by the way, it's a crime in the military. In all the services, it's an abuse. And bullying happens more than once. It's not a one-off. It's this constant continuing with no identifiable end point, it usually ends either when the bully or the service member moves to another location, all right? This is when you thank God that we have people who rotate to different positions, because otherwise, if you were civilian, you'd be stuck with that person. And, and workplace bullying, by the way, has been an ongoing research topic in the industrial organizational psychology field for decades, decades, all right? So this, again, is not a unique characteristic, but to the military, but it's something we've got to get our arms around. We can't say, well, they do it in civilian too, so why should we worry about it? It's wrong. Bullying is wrong no matter where it happens. Sexual assault is wrong no matter where it happens. Suicides are destructive no matter where they happen. Radicalization can be disrupted no matter where they happen. So simply saying we're not as bad as somebody else, we've got to avoid that. And that's a common, unfortunately, a common way that we don't have change. Well, I'm not as bad as everybody else, therefore I'm not going to change. All right. Now, again, there's lots of means of different bullying. You can do it by spreading rumors, by isolating people, withholding information, things like that. And I'm just going to jump to here and show you that when you look at bullying, surprisingly, lesbian, gay, and bisexual service members are no more likely to report bullying scores than non-LGBT service members, but transgender they are, transgender they are. So, you know, his and bullying are prevalent. They're still, it's still very common. All service members reported being bullied or hazed during the military, over a third, over a third of all service members reported being bullied or hazed during the military. So, so think about that, a third, a third. Transgender service members, as I already mentioned, are more likely. Just keep in mind, it's, it's widespread. It's not localized to a particular group, even though non-LGB service members aren't any higher, it's still high, and it's still high among non-LGB as well. So we just need to stop it. it. It doesn't help. It doesn't build anything. It doesn't build 
cohesion. It doesn't build morale. It destroys morale. And it's a cause for why people leave the military. I'm bringing it back to why these corrosives can be detrimental. So I just want to end here with this take-home message. I think this is my last slide. And we have about 10 minutes, hopefully. So corrosives weaken a military. Whether it's Army or Marines, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're an American or a Brit or an Australian or in the Chinese military or South Korea. It weakens the military. And we need to address them before it becomes catastrophic, right? We shouldn't wait until, oh, we're dead, right? We need to do it now. Dignity and respect are still the touchstones of good leadership and unit cohesion. Treating people with dignity and respect, people that you may not respect, but you still treat them with dignity and respect because they're human beings, okay? You may not like your leader, but you don't lie about them. You don't steal from them, right? Just because you don't like someone, okay? You may not have their same beliefs, but that's not a reason not to treat someone with dignity and respect. How we treat each other matters, okay? I would argue that the most important thing, we want the foundations to well-being are our relationships and how we treat each other. Even people we don't like. I've been accused actually of treating people I don't like better than people I do like. So that's a bias I have because I'm compensating. I know cognitively I don't like you for a lot of reasons, but I tend to treat you better, okay? I don't know if that's true or not. That's just what people have shared with me, close friends have shared with me. And we have to avoid minimizing the problem. I mentioned a lot of that. Don't say, well, we're not as bad as the civilians. Well, we're not as bad as the Canadians. Well, we're not as bad. That doesn't help us solve our problems, right? Just because we're not as bad as somebody else doesn't mean we shouldn't be focused on these issues. So I'm going to stop there. Oh, here's my email. Feel free to email me. Uh, uh, your thoughts, your ideas, what I got wrong, what you liked about this presentation, um, and I'm happy to I'm happy to engage. Okay, I'm going to stop the sharing, and we'll go to the questions and answers or questions and see if I have any answers. Uh, so let me stop sharing. Stop sharing. There we go. All right. So, what questions do we have? Uh, Emma, should I just? So, Carl, your first question is, um, do you feel that as a former enlisted SM, you had better insight to the enlisted ranks than those who were not prior enlisted? Well, you know, of course, I'm going to say yes. But, you know, the proof is in the eating of the pudding. I always thought it was the proof is in the pudding. But my wife, who's British, said, no, it's proof is in the eating of the pudding. So I, you know, when I became an officer, I'll never forget something my my first sergeant said to me, and I did the green to gold program. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the army, that's where an enlisted soldier, the green, can go to the university or go to OCS, go to West Point and become an officer, the gold, the gold being the butter bar, right? The little butter bar. And, and when they first rolled out this program, it was voluntary, you know, it's still voluntary. But they didn't get enough volunteers. So those of you in the Army, you know exactly where I'm leading with this. So I was voluntold. My first sergeant, First Sergeant Steele, volunteered me to go to Green to Gold. At first, I was like, wow, First Sergeant, volunteering me to do this. And then I thought, wait a minute, maybe he's trying to get rid of me, right? So you can overinterpret these things. But I'll never forget what he told me. He said, Castro, don't you ever forget where you come from and what this Army's all about. It's about the infantryman, all right? Now, I've since broadened my perspective. It's more than just about the infantryman. It's about armament and field artillery and medics and ordnance and signal and personnel, all of us working together into who it's about. And, you know, as I got older, it's about all the services. It's about civilians, too, that support the military. It's about contractors, right? So as I gained an experience, but I always try to stay in touch with what soldiers are thinking and doing. Okay, what are they thinking and what are they doing? Because it is about them. If you, if you look at the data, those who are most likely to die, be killed in combat, 
it's the infantrymen, the armormen, it's those folks who are doing the on-ground stuff. And we shouldn't forget that. And we should, my own view is let's make their life as easy as possible, right? And it's not make their life easy because it's not easy being in the military in any of the services. It's hard. But I'm a big believer in preventing unnecessary suffering. I tell folks, that's what we do as social workers. We save lives and we prevent unnecessary suffering. Some suffering is necessary, all right? It just is. But much, a lot of the suffering we can prevent. And that's what I really focus on. Let's prevent the unnecessary suffering. But yes, I do think you have to care about people in order to help them the most. So the most effectively, I would argue. So I'll stop there and, and we'll take an extra. I hope that answered your question, uh, whoever asked that. But if not, we can continue continue that conversation. Next question got, is, is there, any, <laughs> is there any research on suicides by family members? You know, there is some emerging. I won't say it's definitive. They just started tracking um, active duty dependent suicides about, I want to say seven or eight years ago, but they really started getting pretty good data about three years ago. I don't know if that's true for uh, veteran family members, but they're, we're just starting to get some data on that. Uh, but it, I wouldn't say it's, oh, and we know the following things and here's what we should do. But I would argue that that family members have some of the same challenges as as old folks do, right, when it comes to um, ending their lives and the challenges they had, these dark moments. So take a look at that dark moment slide. I think that helps us know how we can train people, not train people, that's a terrible way of saying it, that's military language, it's not training you like a dog, but it's educating you to be able to engage in skills to help you through these dark moments, if that makes sense. That's a great question, though. Thank you for that. And Carl, the next question, it's um, actually a three-parter. So um, is there potential is this... for a suicide risk assessment that would be capable of directing interventions and peer support upstream and in real time? How important is this? And does that fit into the stoic model? So let me... So... I love the fact that you brought it back into the stoic model. Thank you for that. The, if we're waiting for folks, to, and I'm stealing work from Greg Bryan again, and if we're waiting for someone to be in crisis before we help them, we're, we've, we missed the boat. We missed the prevention boat, right? It, he had this great quote on his website that says, if people who are in Severe automobile accidents get great care. That's not prevention, right? That's treatment. And waiting for people to be in crisis is not prevention. That's treatment, right? Now, it's prevention in the sense that we're, they may or may not die by suicide, but it's not prevention in the sense of helping them, giving them the skills to help themselves. And one of the things we know about Americans in particular and, and service members specifically is we like to do self-help. We like to do things that help ourselves. And, and, you know, one of the things I've been a big proponent for is developing online uh, uh, access to material that helps people help themselves. Sometimes you need professional help. Right. Sometimes you need a peer, you know, the peer support, and that can be immensely useful, immensely useful. But those peer support folks need to be trained as well. And it is consistent with stoicism. Now, one of the I didn't talk about this. I have a whole lecture on stoic approach to suicide. One of the things that the stoics will say is you have to live your life with dignity. And sometimes Stoics would argue ending your life is the most dignified way to end it, 
Okay, and I know we have a hard time wrapping our head around that, but cult, some cultures actually have this belief too. The most famous, of course, is the Japanese when they disgrace themselves, they they die by suicide. All right, and now I'm not advocating that, by the way, but it, it but it's what is those moments? What are those dark moments for them? It was shame, embarrassment. Uh, I think in America we've gone the wrong, the other direction where folks don't just display enough shame and embarrassment when they make mistakes. Some do, but it really violates their identity of who they think they are and what they stand for. But what we have to acknowledge to ourselves is we all will make mistakes. All of us make mistakes. None of us does everything exactly how we wish we had have done it. I mean, I can't say show of hands, but show of hands how many of us God, I wish I would have said this when this happened. Or, geez, I wish I hadn't said that. That wasn't terribly helpful. Okay, these are the moments we have to sort of reflect back. I remember I said we reflect back. You know, why did I respond that way? Why didn't I act a certain way? Why didn't I speak up when I saw this person being unfairly accused or being treated in a bad way? Why didn't I speak up? These are things that can haunt our, us because it's an insult on our identity, who we are, what we think we stand for. But we have to give ourselves some leeway to make mistakes. We're human beings, after all. We are going to make mistakes. And I would argue experience allows you to make fewer of those mistakes. But doesn't mean older people don't make mistakes. I still make mistakes. I mean, I'm in my 60s and I make mistakes all the time. And you try to, geez, how did I make that mistake? I should have seen, should have seen that coming. So it's about being open to being human, but also vigilant that we are going to self-correct when we make mistakes and not be afraid to apologize and say you're sorry when you made a mistake, right? You've got to go say, I screwed this up. I made a mistake. You very often hear that. I, I don't think I ever heard that. I shouldn't say ever. You rarely hear it in the military. You never rarely hear it in the army. You know, people just do not readily admit to making mistakes. They they defend, they throw their junior enlisted under the bus, they blame the junior enlisted. And the last person you should ever blame are people you supervise for mistakes. Because if somebody makes a mistake, clearly I didn't communicate my intent very well. Or I didn't communicate the what would happen if you didn't meet my intent very well. So that's part of it. It's part of taking care of each other and working together as a team and underwriting mistakes as leaders. I mean, it's another whole lecture about the role of leaders, but leaders have to be willing and able to underwrite mistakes. I used to say, well, they have to be able to underwrite honest mistakes, all right? Well, if you make an honest mistake, I'll underwrite. Good leaders underwrite dishonest mistakes too because they know people are human, and they're going to do things that are selfish. We all do things that are selfish, myself included. But the idea is that's not an honest mistake, doing something selfish. That's a dishonest mistake. But we have to be able to underwrite those two. Does that make sense? So I can't see, but I hope I'm communicating. We've got to be able to underwrite mistakes, admit we're wrong. These are all stoic beliefs, by the way. We're human. The goal is to not repeat the same mistake over and over again, right? It's to learn and be a better person and then be a good role model. This is where peer support can come in, being a good role model for others, other veterans, other active duty folks, a member of society. And the military does an okay job with that, but they could do a better job. I'll stop there. Okay. Um, Carl, we are at time, but if you're willing, um we would you have some time to answer two more questions sure absolutely so the next one is is there a way to prevent corrosiveness at the recruitment stage rather than wait until a soldier serves and receives a negative discharge and and i'm the negative am i now i'm assuming that you're thinking something's happening where we're recruiting people who we shouldn't recruit is that I'm looking to see if I see a thumbs up or uh, an acknowledgement to that. There are certainly things we could do at every stage to make sure we're not cutting corners, we're not lying, we're not, you know, I, I will tell you, I've taught lots of soldiers in about, I would estimate 20%, 25%, maybe a little higher, depending on what group will say my recruiter lied to me on what I was going to do. You know, I was 
I was lied. I was misled. I was told not to say this about my mental health or this about my background or these kinds of things. And now does that happen? Of course it happens. I don't think 25% of the soldiers that I talked to are making that up. So it's happening. It's happening. And the question is, when you then offer up that that happened, should that result in a bad conduct? I would argue, no, it should not. But you're not going to be able to prove, right? Because you're taking this person's word or that person's word. I think that the way we do military discharges is is not fair. I don't think someone who gets a dishonorable discharge necessarily, that should go with them for the rest of their life, right? I think there should be, dependent on the crime, but, you know, like if you had a pre-existing mental health condition that you didn't tell somebody about, that shouldn't be the mark of cane that follows you for the rest of your life where you've got to tell every employer that you've got a less than honorable discharge or something like that. It should have, you know, five years and it, your record is clean and you're now honorable discharge or something like that. I mean, I know that a lot of veterans don't agree with that, but I, th- I just think that there should be no life punishment for certain things, and, and, and that would be one of them. So one more question. And the, the last question is, mentors, mentors are very important, but this does not happen with Black officers because there are not any senior officers, BG, or in key positions to mentor them. How can we make the promotion boards more diverse? Well, just so you know, all the pr- promotion boards that I have served on are diverse, both not in rank, right? That's where there's no diversity, but they're diverse in terms of their military occupation. And they're also diverse in their gender, racial, and ethnic makeup. Now, the problem, of course, is it's usually you know, two or three women, 11 men, you know, because usually boards about 13, 14 folks. And, or it'll be one or two African-Americans and then everybody else is white or Hispanic, or maybe uh, we'll have someone from an Asian background, usually Korean uh, or Vietnamese. So it's really difficult, right? It's really difficult to get the, if you will, the diversity that you would want the the real challenge to me isn't the promotion board issue it's the record you get when you by the time you get to the promotion board so it's where do you score in your enlisted evaluations your officer evaluations because that's what the board looks at they don't look at anything other than what's written on paper and and what's written on paper isn't reflective or if there's biases in it, right? Intended or unintended, the board has to go with what they have in front of them. And, you know, every promotion board gets what's called objectives, where we want you to promote 20% women, we want 5% African American. And I don't know how these percentages are generated, by the way. I've asked and not really gotten an answer I could understand. And every promotion board I've been on, they always come back, so you've met your objectives. But I never understood, well, did we succeed the objective? What do you mean we met our objective? So, you know, one of the things of doing away with the photo was the intent was to help do that, right? To, so they scrub already, you know, on promotion records, whether you're single or married, because there was a suspicion that married service members got an advantage on promotion boards. So they, you can't, you're so... Your marital status is, is X'd out. So I don't know if you're married or not. And then they started Xing out your religion. So they would X out your religion because the idea was that, you know, Protestants got favoritism over other uh, religious groups and they've X that out now. Um, but I could still look at you and see what your gender is. And, you know, and you could still see it because when they write it up, they say her, his, and that kind of thing. Um, and so they're trying to maybe sanitize it too much in some ways because, you know, you do at some level want to know if someone is an African-American or someone is a woman. And if I can't see it in their records, then you're kind of stuck. But really where promotions come from is the mentoring the day you enter, 
And you're absolutely right that it's sometimes difficult for really underrepresented groups to be properly mentored. And that's where you're always hopeful there'll be someone who's not from your ethnic or racial group or gender group or sexual orientation group willing to mentor someone because it's the right thing to do. All right, mentoring is just the right thing to do. And mentoring everyone is the right thing to do. Not me personally mentoring everyone, but everyone should have a mentor. And again, that's very tricky too. Some organizations try to assign mentors and you can't really assign a mentor in the, in the strictest sense of the word mentoring because of that unofficial mentoring that happens. You know, one of the things is, you know, knowing it's kind of like a coaching a basketball team in some sense, because every player, now I don't know this from experience, but I'm, I listen, you know, I read what other coaches say and they say every player on a basketball team has to be motivated differently, right? And if the coach doesn't use the right motivation, it's not going to get the most out of every player, right? But the military likes to do everything the same. We treat everybody the same, and therefore everybody's equal. But I would argue sometimes treating everybody the same is not the right thing to do, right? Think of mentoring as an example, where mentoring should be individualized to the person, right? Everybody has different goals, different aspirations, different backgrounds, different current situations that need to be considered. And you shouldn't, it shouldn't be one style fits everyone. It's each one needs their own mentoring based on where they are, not where the mentor wishes they would be or one size fits all approach. But it is a challenge. It doesn't mean it's insurmountable. As as minorities, as women become more senior, as ethnic and, and racial groups you come see, they need to really embrace the mentoring piece. And I think they do a great job, but there's just not enough of them for everybody. But at the NCO level, for example, in the Army, there are plenty of African-American NCOs, for example, and Hispanic and Latino NCOs who can be effective mentors. The key is breaking through the very top bit, right? Being the four-star general, becoming the command sergeant major of the Army or the Air Force or or being the, the chief, um, you know, master chief of the chief, you know, for the Navy for you know, so those are much more difficult, but not impossible, not impossible. But anyway, thank you for the great questions. We could continue this, I know, for another hour, at least I could. I, I love this topic and I love the military in ways that we can think about doing a better job. But thank you all so much for, for attending and we will make the slides available to everyone who, who would like them.